Good morning, Bethesda. So good to see you in the house of the Lord today, and we want to thank all of those who are joining online. Kimberly and I, um, in the pastoral team, we're just so thankful for your prayers and your support. Uh, everyone has been just so very kind, and also thank you for your continued prayer for Pastor Dan and Becky and their family. Are you ready for the word today? Take your Bible or your source for scripture. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. You know, last week we talked about faith, fourth watch faith, and how that sometimes we end up in a boat we didn't choose, in a storm we didn't see coming. But in the midst of it all, God is above us, God is coming to us, and God is with us. Can I get a witness today? That a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. So we talked about faith, but today I want to talk about failure. You know, sometimes we tend to talk about faith, but we often do not talk much about failure. We'll talk about Noah building the ark in the dark, but we won't talk about his failure of drunkenness and nakedness or We'll talk about Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, but we won't talk about his failure that kept him out of the promised land. Or we'll talk about David running down the hill with a rag and a rock in hand to defeat a giant, but we won't talk about his adultery. Or we'll talk about Simon Peter walking on the water, but we won't talk about him de denying Christ three times. We have a tendency to talk about faith, but what is important is that we also understand that Scripture addresses failure, and even more importantly, what is God's response to our failure? I know we looked at Peter last week, and so we're going to continue to look at Peter this morning in John chapter 21. We're going to read verses 15 through 17, very familiar passage of Scripture. Would you like to stand as we reverence the reading of God's Word? Let's read together. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Can we stop just a moment? Lord, you know all things. Is God not sovereign? Is he not a God of goodness and a God of mercy? Does he not know all things? And of course, let's continue. You know that I love you, Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we just simply say, we need thee, oh, we need thee. Every hour we need thee today, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Of course, we all know that Peter is this kind of blustery, bantering, breast-beating type of guy with a foot-shaped mouth. I love Simon Peter because he's this man of action, is he not? He's this type of man's man. I mean, while everyone else is cowering in fear, he's walking on the water. While everyone is, 
is fleeing and running away. He's chopping off ears. While everybody else is crying at the cabin, he's running down to the tomb to make sure that Jesus is not there. When everyone else is wondering what to say, when Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I am? Simon's lifting his hand. I know the answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I love that about Simon Peter, that he's this type of man of action, and yet there's some things that are missing in his life that Jesus has to address. I love that about the kingdom, that God is always more interested in the who before the do, that who we are is always more important than what we do. That with God, he's more interested in our character than our competence or our nature than our notoriety. That he's more interested to make sure that he addresses the question of our soul before he addresses the question of our serve. Because he doesn't go to Simon Peter and say, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, before he asks the question, who do... You say that I am, and then, Simon, do you love me? He addresses the inner part of Simon's life, the state of his soul before the state of his serve. And I think when when we study the scriptures, we understand that, that God is interested in asking that question today, if I was to title the sermon, I would just simply say, do you love me? Because it's a question about the state of our soul. Do you love me? Simon Peter, do you love me? And Simon, who is this kind of arrogant um, leader who has to learn humility and how to play on a team, Jesus comes along and sends a cocky rooster into his life. to declare all of his faults and failures. I know nobody here can relate. You've never had a cocky rooster show up in your life and declare all of your faults and failures. I know nobody here has ever experienced what it means to get knocked off the horse of your imperfection. Nobody here has ever experienced what it's like to fall down and scrape up your spiritual knees or to fall prey to the flesh and the thing that you don't want to do, you end up doing. Or to even walk in on a Sunday morning and you're trying to wear a mask of happiness and joy, but down on the inside you know you've struggled all week long. And even the appearance of a spiritual rock somehow deep on the inside gives way to the affirmation that all I am is sinking sand. So Simon Peter is confronted by a rooster. And you remember it was Simon who said, Lord, I don't know what everybody else is going to do, but I'll never deny you. Everyone else may deny you, but, but not me. I will go all the way to the death for you. I look at this story of Simon Peter and I'm so thankful for Simon because he proves to us that even spiritual rocks crumble at times. And if I can just be candid and transparent, we've all seen over the last few years high-profile Leaders in the church stumble and fall down and and we hear questions like, well, how could that happen? How could such a thing happen? Loved ones, we all make mistakes. We all crumble 
we all fall down and skin up our spiritual knees. We all understand that there are times that, that we fail Christ, that we deny Christ. Yes, we have to stand up against sin, and there is a, 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 a consequence to our sin, and we're experiencing that even in this house. But can I just say to you, when I fall down, don't sit on me. Somebody help me up. When I fall down and scrape up my spiritual knees, don't tell me what I did wrong. Somebody help me up. Clean out the scrape, the wound. Put a Band-Aid on it and help me to keep going. If you see something in my eye, don't let it stay there. Help me get it out. Somebody help me get it out. Because we all make mistakes and it's almost like sometimes we think, not just with Christian leaders, but as Christians, we're placed on this pedestal of perfection as if we never make mistakes, as if we're this rock of Gibraltar that never falters and never fails. And yet what happens in Simon Peter's life is because of his failure, Jesus pursues him even more. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? If you're, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down, especially if you want the message to help you tomorrow and not just today. Because we forget about 90% of everything we hear, according to sociologists, within 72 hours. God's love is sticky. Sticky. It's hard to wash God's love off. If you've ever had honey on your hands and you tried to wash it off, even after you try to wash it off, it's almost like you still feel the residue of that honey on your hands. And that's what happens to Simon Peter. Jesus doesn't let him forget that his love has residue. I know many of us remember what happened in Mark chapter 16 when Jesus resurrects from the dead and the two Marys and Salome come to the, to, the, to the tomb and there's an angel of the Lord there. Mark says it's a young man, but Matthew says it's the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord is there and we read in Mark chapter 16, verse 6 and 7, I think we have it on the, the screen and the angel of the Lord says, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples. He, he didn't have to add those last two words. Did he? I mean, this is the first utterance after the resurrection. And he's talking about Jesus being risen, that he's not here, that he's alive. And then the angel of the Lord says, go tell the disciples. And, and let me add two words. And Peter, it's almost like he left a sticky note. God ever left a sticky note for you until Wayman and Kimberly and Brent and Janice just remind them Simon son of Jonah 
Isn't that intriguing? He doesn't even use Peter. Peter's name has been changed by Jesus. It's, it's a rock. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter's the spiritual rock, and yet at this moment, Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah. I want to see if not just the spiritual rock loves me, but the flesh and blood fisherman. I want to know if you, Simon, really know, if you really love me, not just on Sunday, but on Monday. Not just when you're in the house of the fellowship of believers praising and worshiping me as a spiritual rock, but on Monday when you're Simon, son of Jonah, me then because my love is sticky Simon son of Jonah do you love me more than these now that's the first and only time in these three questions that Jesus says do you love me more than these because you recall again as I mentioned previously that Simon had said, Lord, I don't know what everybody else is going to do. They're going to deny you. They may deny you, but not me. I will go all the way to the death for you. In other words, I love you more than everyone else. My question is, does Jesus expect us to love him more than these? Does he expect us to love him more than everyone else? May I just admonish you that God's love is not just sticky, but God's love is secure? Do you really think that God's love is a race, is a competition, is a comparison game? Do you, do you think that Jesus expected Simon Peter to love him more than everybody else. I know we live in a very performance-driven culture and winning at all costs has become the mantra, right? And it's almost like second place is the first to lose. And in our culture, it's all about competition and getting there first. I remember uh, before moving to Fort Worth, my wife and I lived in uh, in northern LA and there was this this two-lane road this intersection and you'd come up to the intersection and after the intersection the two lanes would merge into one lane and it was known as the chicken intersection because people would line up there at that intersection start revving their motors, their engines, and as soon as the light turned green, they were off. And I don't know how many times I would pull up to that intersection and I would sneak a peek <laughs> out of my eye to see who was next to me at the intersection. And I would lean in my car and I would start trying to time the lights and the light would turn green, and off I would go jockeying for position. And many times, I know you're thinking that's a man thing, but many times I was racing women. <laughs> Come on, ladies. And it was called the chicken intersection because you would race right up against one another and then somebody would have to make a decision. <laughs> Do I let off the gas? Until I was, I was racing one time and, and I actually heard the whisper of the Lord saying, do you really have to win? And 
And so one day I pulled up to the intersection. The light turned green. And I just drove nice and slow. Made it through that two lane into the one lane. And, and I thought that was so peaceful. Do you recognize that, that God's love is not a competition? It's not a race. May I simply share that God does not expect you to love him more than your spouse or more than the person that you're sitting next to or more than anyone else in this church today. God just expects you to love him with your heart, your mind, soul and your strength God's love to the fourth power will you give him everything that you have because I think God's love is, is secure it's for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Maybe we should just make it something we can grab a hold of today, for I am persuaded that neither personal failures, nor betrayal, nor lack of church attendance, nor lack of prayer, nor lack of Bible reading, nor lack of, nor doubt, nor discouragement, nor fear can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Because God's love is not just sticky and secure, but it's stubborn. I think there's a song about that. It's stubborn. You know, I, I've grown up in a Christian's home my whole life and and still there are times that I feel like I'm just kind of stumbling and and bumbling along trying to to get to Jesus as if I, I, I make mistakes and I I fail and we we think that that we're stumbling along and we're trying to to get to Jesus and all of a sudden Jesus turns around and points to us and we're excited Jesus he knows your name and he points to us and it's like he wants me even though I'm stumbling and bumbling along and we, we run toward Jesus just like the, the prodigal son running to the father that, that does not deserve his love and we're running toward him and we think all of a sudden that, that Jesus turns around and, and he points and he says, no, no, not you. I want the person behind you. But that's not who Jesus is. He doesn't just want the person behind us. He wants us. He wants you with all your faults and failures and mistakes. He wants me when I'm stumbling and bumbling along and I'm not sitting on that pedestal of perfection because sometimes I, I feel like I'm playing Handel's Messiah with the kazoo. And yet God doesn't want all the, the great players in the orchestra. He wants all the players. He wants the good players. He wants the kazoos. Because his love is stubborn. And he asked Simon Peter, not just once, but three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you, 
do you love me? And I don't have time to get into all of the differences in the Greek words of love between phileo and agape and how, how, how Simon Peter was never able to say, I agape love you. He was never, never at this point able to get to that deep point of love with Jesus in his response because he knew what happened beforehand. But I'll tell you that Jesus gave him the test until he passed it. Isn't, isn't that what Jesus does? He, he gives us the test until we pass it. If we deny that we know him three times, he'll give us the test three times. Just so we can affirm and say, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I really love you. Yes, Lord, I really, really love you. And just as many times as we fail him, he gives us the test over and over again to affirm our love for him until we pass it. And isn't it amazing that Jesus still saw the value in Simon Peter in the kingdom because after he addresses the state of his soul, he addresses the state of his servants and said, okay, if you love me, feed my sheep. Did you know even when we make mistakes in the kingdom of God, he still values our ability to serve him? Now there may need to be restoration and things happen. We may never feel the same positions that we filled previously because there has to be uh, restoration and healing. But I can tell you that you are still valuable in the kingdom of God. And even in the midst of your failures, God will say, feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep if you, if you really love me. Even though you denied me, if you love me, stay on course in the kingdom. Now finally, God's love is sticky and secure and stubborn. And I want to say, well, let me say this first. Some of you don't know, but I am a man of symmetry. Let me just put it this, that way. I love symmetry and order. I mean, if there are six pillars on this side of the stage, I want to see six pillars. <laughs> if there are two doors over here, I want to see two doors over there. If there's a piano here, I want to see. No, no. So everything within me wants to come up with a word that starts with S. <laughs> Pastor Marty is going to leave unfulfilled today <laughs> if I don't come up with another word that is Starts with S. <laughs> so I want to I say that God's love is symmetrical. But that's not really the case. Because God's love is not always organized and ordered and neat and clean and fits in our little box of demarcation. Sometimes God's love is unfair. I mean, certainly if there's one attribute of God that we should be able to hang our hat on, should it not be that God is fair? That God is the eternal monitor of fairness? That his love is fair? And yet, you read so many examples in Scripture from the prodigal son to the woman caught in adultery to Zacchaeus and on and on. Examples that it just, 
doesn't seem like God is fair. Or you read in Matthew chapter 20 about the owner of the vineyard. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, he invites people to go work in the vineyard. And he promises them, the, the King James Version says, a denarius. New King James says, a penny. If you'll go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning and work from 6 to 6, I'll give you a penny. But then he goes out at 9 o'clock and at noon and at 3 p.m., and even at 5 p.m., one hour from closing, and he invites people to go into the vineyard and work one hour before closing, 6 o'clock. The day ends. They go to receive their wages. Those who worked from 6 to 6 receive one penny. Isn't that what the owner promised? But those who worked for one hour from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., guess how much they received? Can you imagine that today? For those of us who have a measure of fairness, we would, we would have lawsuits, capricious litigation, discrimination, my employer only gave me one penny for working all day long, but my fellow laborers only worked one hour, and they received the same amount. And what is even more disturbing to me about that story is that Jesus says, that's what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like. Talk about unfair. Perhaps the most unfair story of them all is the thief who is hanging on the cross. And he's hanging there and he's getting what he deserves. His life is over. He has no more maneuverings in the court system. No more plays. He's getting what he deserves. And he goes to the field with one hour left. And he says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Can you imagine what he was thinking? What did I just say? remember me. You, he doesn't even know me. When you come into your, why would he want someone like me in his kingdom? I'm getting what I deserve. This is my just punishment. Why would this man who doesn't even know me want me in his kingdom? Is that, is that fair? When this man who left a wake of destruction behind him, his life is over. He's getting what he deserves. And he works for one hour, just one moment. And he turns to Jesus and says, remember me. Moment, Jesus saves him. Is that fair? Is it fair? When I was standing at the deathbed of a man who had AIDS and he was dying in the hospital, and he's dying, and in one moment, he looks up to God and he says, God, somehow. Forgive me when his family is falling apart. He's left a wake of destruction behind him. And he's laying on his deathbed. 
And he cries out to God and says, God, forgive me. And I'll tell you in just one brief moment, it came to my mind. You know, I, here I've been serving God my whole life. I've preached the gospel in more than 40 nations around the world. I've sacrificially given to God in just a brief moment. I'm just being transparent with you. And I'm thinking this man, just before he dies, cries out to God and God saves him. Is that fair? But then whoever said that God's love was symmetrical or fair. God's love does not always fit in this nice little box that we order and organize because God's love may not always be fair, but it's absolutely amazing. Closing. Well, thank you, sis. My hanky's up there. Wow. I'll close with this. I, I was sitting in, in the laundry room where my office used to be a few years ago, and I was struggling with all of this. Pastor Brent, I was just struggling with this whole idea of failure and how Sometimes we all fail, and how I fail. And I was keenly aware of another presence in the room. My wife had come in, and she had put her arms around me, leaned down, put her arms around me. She didn't know what I was struggling with. And then all of a sudden, my, my son Garrett came into the room, and, and he put his arms around his mother's and around me and I was keenly aware that I was getting a double hug <laughs> and without even knowing it my wife whispers into my ear who loves you babe and sheepishly I said well I know you do but then it was that quickening of the Holy Spirit Jesus himself whispered on the inside when I was struggling with it all. Who loves you, babe? And I heard myself say, today if, if you're struggling with failure or that question or you're wondering how in the world does God look down at us in the midst of our failure? How? What is his response? I, I even think we should change the name of the sermon. It should not even be do you love me? I think the really what was going on be below the surface was Jesus was saying to Simon, who loves you, Simon? It wasn't about Simon's love at all. It was about Jesus' love for Simon in the midst of his failures. I want to ask you just to, to stand with me very quickly, everyone all across the, the balcony, everyone who's listening online. Because I kind of feel like that messenger that was sent from the Lord when the Marys and Salome came and, and he said, hey, go tell the disciples and, and Peter. Can I just say to you that Jesus loves you. Who loves you, Simon? Who loves you, babe?
do you understand how much Jesus loves you in the midst of every storm, every circumstance? Do you know how much Jesus loves Pastor Dan and his family? How much he loves Bethesda in this community of faith? How much he loves us that even when we fall down and scrape up our spiritual knees, he pursues us. The hound of heaven pursues us. And I'm going to ask you right now, if you're, you're struggling with failure, you know that everything is not right between you and the Lord. You know that there's just some things that have kept you apart from Jesus. Can I just ask you right now to respond? I'm going to count to three. You say, but everybody's watching. Everybody's looking. What an incredible, mo incredible moment for you to say, I love Jesus, and nothing is going to stop me from getting to Jesus. Nothing is going to stop me from saying, Jesus, in spite of all of the things that have happened in my life, I dedicate my life to you. Some of you, this may be the first time that you commit your life to Jesus. For others, it may be a, a rededication of your life. But this is your moment. Don't, don't let this divine moment where the hound of heaven pursues you to keep you from making a decision to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. If that's you, one, two, don't hesitate. Three, let me see your hand right now. You want to dedicate your life to Jesus, whether this is a first-time dedication or a rededication to the Lord. I, I see the hands. Most importantly, Jesus sees the hands. Those of you who are online, Jesus sees you right where you are right now. What you've just done is raised your hand to say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. The next step is really the most important step because it's the moment that you just, you not only say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior, but I want you to be my Lord. I want to follow you. I don't want just, I don't need just forgiveness of sin but I want to follow you all the days of my life. If that's you today, you raised your hand and you want to know him as Lord, not just as Savior, not just as someone who forgives you of your sin, but someone who walks with you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Don't hesitate. Just come right now and stand across the front. We have prayer teams that will come. We'll talk with you. We'll pray with you. If you lifted your hand today and you said, Lord, I'm getting ready, rid of everything that would keep me from you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I really love you. Lord, I really, really love you. If you're in the balcony, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for you to come. This is a, a critical moment. I know we're a little bit past time, but how many know this is the most important decision that we could see to, today in this service? I told the staff this week that one thing that, that, that I will do in every service is I will give a, an altar call, an opportunity for people to know Jesus. Would you bow your heads and would you pray this after me today, Lord Jesus. Everyone together, I come to you now. Forgive me of my sin. I want to know you as Savior, and I want to know you as Lord. Thank you that you love me, Jesus. In the midst of all my failures, thank you for loving me. Teach me. Help me to grow in faith, in understanding that I may reflect you to those around me all the days of my life in Jesus name amen
can we give God praise today?